All right, and joining me via Zoom, very genuinely excited to have this guest. He is, of course, ESPN's lead bracketologist. Also, new book coming out March 2nd, Bracketology, March Madness, College Basketball, and the Creation of a National Obsession. He needs no introduction. Joe Lenardi, how you doing, Joe? Thank you for joining me. I'm great, Aaron, and uh, thanks for the plug. We appreciate it. Well, it's really interesting because independent of, of you having a book out, which I know is going to cover a lot of this ground and people can, I, I'm guessing, pre-order it, but it'll be available March 2nd. It was a question I've always wondered. I mean, I mean, how you said it in the title, a national obsession, and it is. Um, how did this all start? I mean, we were all the kid in our, our room when we were younger, uh, you know, filling out brackets and making our own brackets and doing all that stuff. And, and as you and I were talking before, this is now uh, your brand, your, your what you do, uh, what in some degrees, what, you, what you're known for. How did this all start for you, Joe? Yeah, I guess I'm now living proof that you don't have to be able to read a book to write one. <laughs> sure. Uh, but, you know, so, so, somewhere my hooked on phonics teacher is, is uh, rolling over in her grave. Y you know, uh, I was one of those guys playing with brackets. You're right. Uh, long before the internet, long before uh, ESPN, certainly long before, you know, I had a platform on a national network. Uh, I left college. I went to a basketball school, St. Joe's in Philadelphia, and kind of grew up around the Philadelphia Big Five and all the, the great programs here. And looking back, I, I, I think I was majoring in college basketball without even really knowing it at the time, because of all, you know, the time I spent following the local teams and writing about them first for uh, you know, a school newspaper, and then as a stringer, and uh, worked for a suburban daily here in the Philadelphia area, and also a stringer for uh, the, the major dailies, and so on, and in almost every one of those years, at least one, if not more, of the local teams was really good, and a factor in the national picture, and uh, playing in the NCAA tournament, and oftentimes advancing uh, quite far in the NCAA tournament. I, I, I you know, I, I think of, you, you know, my first year of college, Penn from the Ivy League went to the Final Four. Sure. So, you know, Penn, Temple, St. Joe's, LaSalle, Villanova, they've all had their moments, even Drexel, the sixth Division One program in town. And I've covered tournament wins for all of those programs and tournament teams from all of those programs. So it, it, was almost impossible, Aaron, to kind of not, for lack of a better term, you know, develop a fascination in the tournament. Yep. Uh, and, and me being a little bit, <clears throat> maybe more than a little bit of a nerd for such things, uh, you know, how is the tournament put together? And I guess that came to a head uh, in 1981. I was a junior at St. Joe's and in those days, it was a 48-team tournament. Uh, and the top four seeds in each region got a bye. And I was the beat writer for the school paper. And the Hawks got in as in an 8-9 game, paired with the number one overall seed, uh, DePaul, undefeated, number one. And I just remember thinking to myself when I saw the bracket, maybe we could be the one. Hmm, to do yeah. that and pull that upset, kind of like the UMBC of its time, if you will. Uh, and lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. You know, the Hawks win at the buzzer. And from that moment, you, you know, beating the one, beating the one seed uh, and being in the building for it uh, just kind of galvanized me. The Hawks that year eventually went, uh, won in the Sweet 16, played an Elite Eight game, believe it or not, against Indiana at Indiana wow. with Isaiah Thomas when you could still play at home. Needless to say, that did not go well uh, for the visiting team. But 
again, talk about galvanizing. Had we won that game and made the final four, the final four was in Philly. Wow. Like, like my Hawks would have been this year's Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Sure. Right. Getting to play their Super Bowl, you know, in, in, in their hometown. And, uh, Temple University was the host that year. We had already been a lot of the, the, the you, you know, the sports interns and college writers and editors. When we had already been recruited to work the Final Four as runners and stat people, and so, so like here I am, a junior in college, and that March, getting to attend like courtside every round of the tournament, uh, it would have been impossible not to have that kind of get in your blood. So I think that's where it all started. It makes you feel better. Um, sort of a simple well, one, you know, I was telling you before I grew up in Connecticut, went to UConn, my junior year, UConn also lost in the elite eight to George Mason. So it was the exact opposite. It was like, you know, one of the biggest upsets in the history of the tournament when everyone thinks your team is going to win. Uh, you know, it wasn't quite as as good of a feel good story. And uh, I wasn't there as a freshman when they won it with Okafor. But, you know, I am very much, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up around the sport like you. And, and I think you're right is, you know, I, I know so many people that do this now for a profession went to a UConn, a St. Joe's. I know Jeff Goodman went to Arizona. It gets in your blood and it, it, it you know, it, it stays with you when, um, first of all, let me, I wasn't going to, this is completely off subject, but I, John Chaney, I mean, he just passed away and he's a Philadelphia mm -hmm. icon. And I'll be honest, I, I didn't talk a ton about it on this show, but I will say when I was growing up, I mean, he was one of the two, three guys that every year I loved watching his teams. They played so hard. Um, and, you know, to, to bring a kind of a bracketology twist into it, he's kind of the first person that I remember being so overt about how important out of conference scheduling was mm -hmm. and kind of the idea you got to play wherever they'll, they'll take you. Uh, so you obviously spent a ton of time around him. I, I didn't have it in my notes here, but I mean, I feel like you'd be as good as anybody to speak on, uh, you know, his recent passing and what he meant to the sport. He really was ahead of his time in many, many ways, even though I think most people, the way they would react to him, the thoughts that would come out if he did like word association would be like old school. Yeah. Right. Like, like hard nose, old fashioned, you know, 5.30 AM practice, the whole thing. And it, it just, you know, a little, little inside baseball here. Uh, high school basketball in the Philly area is just starting for this year in the, in the, you know, uh, COVID environment. And many of the city schools who were starting this week in tribute started their year at 5.30 in the morning on Monday. Yeah, so And I think that's pretty cool. Sure. Uh, I think the only thing even cooler is that I didn't have to go cover any of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, 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 I covered Temple a lot, including their number one ranked team in 1988. And I had more than a couple 5.30 in the morning trips to uh, McGonagall Hall on North Broad Street. And I can tell you, it's really cold and dark um, <laughs> there in, in January and February uh, at, at, at that point. Uh, but having said all that, he knew, he knew, you know, in the Atlantic 10, a good league, but not a great league, uh, a multi-bid league. Uh, but but again, not, you know, the ACC or the, 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 the Big Ten or whatever. Uh, in order to differentiate himself, in, in those days, you had to get on television. And you had to get on a certain four-letter network that I might be associated with. Sure. Because a lot of the others who are now into college basketball weren't yet. They hadn't discovered the amount of really – good inventory that existed you know we weren't that far removed from like the the ECAC game of the week on a Saturday sure. and you know one weeknight game with Notre Dame uh which is how it was when I was growing up hmm. but you know so Cheney would say okay Kansas you, you want to play three for one uh okay ESPN you you want me to play midnight at I don't know what okay here we go 
Yeah. I don't care. And as it turns out, the way that they played and the way that he coached, it didn't matter where the game was. Sure. Because they were unbreakable in how they played. They were going to do what they did, which was take care of the ball, get a shot on every possession. Not, not necessarily a good shot, but a shot on every possession. Crash the offensive glass with he liked to play the equivalent of two bigs like two big bigs, which nobody would today. And the matchups don't just kind of cut the floor in half and made it really hard to score against them. And and there were soft spots in that matchup zone and they were typically in the corners. And if you could make a lot of threes, you would beat them. And he would say, I don't care. The numbers are in my favor. Uh, And if you make them, we get beat. But he, he, you know, the, 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 the number of up games that they would win both in the regular season, typically on national television. And then in the tournament, like it was almost like a game when the bracket came out, like they'd be an 11 or 10 or whatever. And you'd see the matched up against some kind of no nothing, big time school that couldn't spell zone. If you spotted them, the Z and the O <laughs> sure, and, sure. Uh, and you'd be like, well, they're not beating him. Like, it's going to be 58-54, but they're not winning. Mm. And now, as it turned out, later in the rounds, I, I believe, you know, five elite eights never quite getting over the hump. But playing elite teams in every one of those games, sometimes they just got out-talented. Sure. At, at, at the end of the road, be, be, because, you know, the way they played kept both teams in the game at the same time. And if the other guy has better players and it's 60 to 60 with two minutes to go, you're probably going to lose. Yeah. I think that that was, but most of it, they almost never lost to teams below them. Like they just didn't get upset. Yeah. I think that was the step. I know in the five elite eights that he made only one time, was he the higher seed? And I, there was some crazy stat about the amount of times that he lost as a higher seed in the NCAA tournament. It wasn't very many. So Thank you for sharing that. And, and yeah, I thought, you know, you'd be perfect to speak on that. Uh, let's get back to yeah, they were a one and they lost to a two. Is that what it was? Okay. Well, there you go. That happens quite a bit. So. Yeah. I mean, I was at four of the five elite eight games and I remember that one very well. Interesting. All right. Bracketology back to it. My next question on bracketology. You, I think we, I saw a press release that recently, you know, you're, you're going to be at ESPN a few more years. Congratulations on that announcement. And so I guess 25 years, is that, the, you know, 95 or somewhere in there? When did you realize yeah. how big bracketology was, how big there's a demand for it? Was there ever like a moment you personally, you know, were stopped in the airport for a picture or anything? I mean, when did you really realize how big <laughs> bracketology was and the, the, the thirst that there was for it? I hope I don't get my contract ripped up for saying this, <laughs> Uh-oh. but yes, I have been affiliated and published on ESPN for 25 years. Okay. okay. I'm fairly certain in the initial few years, I was not getting paid. Uh, I, I was working for the blue ribbon yearbook I, and eventually owned the blue ribbon yearbook, which in its day was the Bible of college basketball publications, you know, the phone book approach to preseason previews, not, you know, the magazine approach. Uh, and, and then when we added a postseason tournament edition in 95, that led to me projecting brackets and then us approaching ESPN about putting those projections online wow. on this fledgling website called ESPN Sports Zone in return for them listing an 800 number, <laughs> which people could call and order the postseason book. Like all of those things in hindsight sounds so, you know, like rotary phone-ish, right? Yep. Like number one, nobody calls an 800 number to buy anything anymore. Nope. Number Getting two, for calling eight, guess, nine hundred right. <laughs> yeah. I guess Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Fully. Sure. And, uh, Finally, y- y- you know, the thought of like a website paying a sports writer for unique content 
like none of those things were a thing. And I was, you know, all about covering games and writing on deadline in, 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 in my actual lives and, and doing my day job at, at St. Joe's along the way. Uh, so, so I guess if there was an aha moment, and actually this is a good segue, we, we, this is one of, one of the really lengthy sections of, of the book and hopefully an interesting section for, for insiders and others. Uh, I, I had an editor at dot com and dot, dot com was was rolling by this point. This is 2002. Uh, my editor, a guy named Ron Buck, who's still there. Good guy. Uh, decided, Joe, what do you think if we blow out bracketology? And like, I didn't even know what that meant. But it meant, you know, give it its own page and take my picture and put it up and have a have a fancy looking bracket as opposed to just lines of text, which is what it had been. All right, three plays 14, et cetera, you know, with little numbers and parentheses. I mean, an actual bracket and then clicking on the teams and getting their resume and their stats and their data and commentary from me or whomever. And that launched uh, on, on Martin Luther King Day of 2002 that full bracketology page and it got a quarter of a million hits in 45 minutes wow and this we kind of looked at each other keep in mind this is pretty yeah, social media you can't put it on twitter you can't put correct. it correct etc yeah correct we looked at each other and went holy split yeah. uh <laughs> like maybe we you know maybe people really like this stuff and, you know, later that year, again, fledgling channel ESPN News, okay, which at that time was basically a lower budget sports center. It was literally live news all day long. Uh, and they needed, you know, they didn't have a stable of analysts like sports center and the regular ESPN. So somebody had the idea to put this racket guy on tv uh talking about teams and then every year it just grew and grew a little bit at a time again there was no grand plan for this yeah it wasn't my primary job or source of income and i'm not that smart so like it was you know it was right place right time and um you know i i don't know that you know, I get a little uncomfortable when people say, well, he's the best. That's really a matter of opinion. I was definitely the first and there's, there's cachet that comes with that. And I don't take it for granted and it never stops me from trying to be the best. Uh, but, but I think that there are a lot of people who are better with numbers and analytics, et cetera. Uh, if, if we bring anything different to the table, I think it's the fact of being able to com communicate, you know, kind of complicated material in a in a in a you know layperson, lighthearted way, taking the material seriously, and hopefully not myself. Well, and that's a great segue to my next question, which is, you know, taking the material seriously. And listen, I'm in the media. I know how hard everybody in this business works, but how I, I'm sure there are people, Oh, you hate my team. And uh, you know, of course you probably threw this bracket together in two minutes. How, how much does, how long does it take to put a bracket together? You're obviously watching games. You're, you're, you're checking box scores. You're, you're analyzing how for, I think every Tuesday, Friday, or so, somewhere in that regard, you put up a, a, a new bracket. How long does it take? Because even if you kind of know the teams that you're going to put in, Every weekend, there's a new data point of wins and losses that have to make you adjust this thing. And that's a really insightful observation by you because, yes, uh, every minute there could be a new data point. And if it were that minute that the committee was voting, <laughs> right, they would vote in that snapshot of a moment. Sure. Uh, which is why I always get a kick out of, and, and it's timely, this Saturday – you know, we're going to get the sneak preview of 
you know, the top 16 teams, four lines, each region from the committee. Uh, and this is going to sound snarky and I don't mean it to be, mm -hmm. uh, like this isn't like college football where you can put something up on a Monday or a Tuesday night and then no one plays until the following Saturday. Sure. And you can debate and dissect and diverge and all those things. You know, I, I remember one year they did the 16 and like the last team in on their board at that moment you know, voted on the night before the 16th team was playing in the game in which the 16 were revealed and getting blasted. Yeah. Yeah. So like they were out of the 16 before they even were in the 16. Yep. And of course, because, you know, it is the committee speaking and they are, you know, I like to tell people, I don't have a vote. Uh, you know, I, I spend maybe a, a disproportionate amount of time paying attention to their 16 when the truth is by dinner time Saturday night, it's going to be obsolete. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, that frequency of change is just part of what makes this unique and why I've had to adjust over the years to be able to make adjustments to seeding and in some cases bracketing in real time. Uh, whereas in my early years, I, I was able to do the snapshot approach, w you know, but now again, it's a 24 seven media and medium, you know, whoever invented that scroll on the bottom of the screen where whenever a game changes, people look for updates, right? I have to be able, I have to be able to, ant, or it could be the next halftime or the next in between games. And, you know, now it's post Super Bowl, So the stuff is going from uh, online and, and social media to being on the air a, a fair amount. And, you know, all right, Joe, we got 15 minutes before the next tip. What's your update? So at any point I need to, you know, top seeds, bubble, you know, break down from this league or that league. Uh, you know, I've already talked to one of the big games tonight as we're recording this is Texas Tech and West Virginia. Yep. So I've heard from the producer and, 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 and one of the commentators, all right, Joe, where do you have those teams? And about 80% of my work is providing that information on a day-to-day -day basis for the production crews and the studio shows because from now and until the end of championship week, Lord willing that we have it, uh, every game needs the context of where do these teams stand. We don't necessarily need it in November, but we really need it now. So uh, my, th th that's my life right now. And it's both exhilarating and exhausting. Sure. I wouldn't trade it for the world. No one would. If, if you love our sport and uh, it, 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 it's what makes what I do probably a little bit different from anybody else yep. who's, who's doing brackets and, you know, may, maybe in my wind down life, I'll, I'll, I'll get to go back to the snapshot way of doing it. Uh, but that's just not realistic right now, given the fact that, you know, I work for a company that, does you know like 1600 games a year sure and wants to know where every team stands in every one of them by the way now they're doing 2 p.m eastern time tip-offs i'm sure that's just a thrill the, the whole cycle starts earlier but so it, it's an interesting question and so now let's i don't even want to get into specific team necessarily but I mentioned to you, well, actually on air, but also off air, I'm a UConn alum, you know, for, for the UConn fan that's now on the bubble, for the Arkansas fan, for the Clemson fan, for whoever, NC, I don't even know who's even on the bubble necessarily. What are the actual important things, right? Because I kind of joke tongue in cheek, you know, you, why do you hate my team? But I think there's probably a fan base that says, you know, let's just use Clemson as a hypothetical. And I don't know if how even close they are to the bubble, but they'll sit there and say, we're in the ACC. We beat Alabama in the out of conference. We're in. What are you talking about? So, like, <laughs> 
what are the metrics that fans actually need to be looking at right now that go into the bracket that you will make uh, and continue to update between now and Selection Sunday? First of all, the odds are excellent that I do hate your team. <laughs> because what did it really do to you? No, I'm kidding. No, no, it's just math. There yeah. are 357 Division I playing schools. I think this year I counted 340 of them are eligible for the NCAA tournament. So I can only put 68 in at a time. So if my math is right, that means at any moment, 272 of them are going to hate my guts. Sure. And there isn't anything I can do about that. Yeah. Um, you know, unless we go to the Coach K plane and put every team in the corner, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yes, if you think I hate your team, you're probably right. Uh, <laughs> but so what do I look at? Let, let, let's forget about the COVID year in particular and just speak in general terms. If, if, if you just dropped in from another planet, and someone was trying to explain this process to you, and you were a pretty bright person, you would get the following basics. Okay, 68 out of 350 some get to play for a championship. 32 of the 68 are selected for us. And we've just deputized this new person on planet earth to be the committee, right? So now you're doing your math. You go, okay, so my job is to pick the next best 36, or more accurately, the best available 36 out of the remaining 320 some or so. So basically about 10%, a little over 10%. So I have to sit here. I've never seen a basketball game. I don't know Rawlings from Spalding, okay? But I know what 10% is. That means I have to find the best of the best. So, and, and the, the, the end goal is to identify the teams that are best equipped to play in a tournament with other teams like them, the top 10%. So it seems to me that as a person who doesn't know anything about anything, the best way to go about it would be to say, all right, in the 30 to 35 game sample that I have for each of these teams, how did they do when they played other teams like that? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, again, approaching it like a logic problem and not a basketball person. Makes sense. Like I would say, okay, Clemson, uh, you played 11 games against teams that are roughly in the top 50, which is about what my universe is. And you went 500. Okay. That would seem to suggest that in a game, in a tournament with teams like that, you have a 50, 50 chance of winning. That seems like a pretty good, that, that you should be on the list, right? You should be on the list. Uh, now, if you're Maryland and it's 2021, you've already played 14 of those games. This is now not hypothetical. This is today. Sure. Right? And you've lost 10 of them. So do I give more weight to the four or the 10? Right? Right? And, and this is where, you know, the committee members really have to make their tougher evaluations because clearly Maryland's upside, especially since three of those four wins are on the road. Uh, in this case, I think it was Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And then they also beat Purdue at home. This is irrespective of the fact that, you know, the home road, differential is a little bit different this year but you say okay do i want to vote with their upside or their 
downside. And there, there's no right or wrong answer to that. It could be you and I and eight people out of the stands that form the committee. And I guarantee we're all going to have a different opinion of what to weigh as the most important factor. I, I, I would look and say, you know, uh, when were those four wins? Like, are they doing it now or did they do it in December? Right? Even though that's no longer an official criteria, it would matter to me. You might say, I saw them play three times in the last two weeks and they blow, right? Like, yeah. like they're turning it over. Somebody twisted his ankle. They, 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 they can't defend the ball screen. What, what, whatever your it is, is legitimate. Uh, and at the end of the day, when I get in trouble, me, meaning start to get things wrong, is when I inject my opinion yeah. instead of what I think the committee will do. Because that is an enormous difference. If I was voting and it was Drake against Maryland, I would take Drake because I think winning matters. And I realized that neither team is starting from the same starting point in this race. It's like an Olympic run, they're staggered starts. It's not apples and apples. But it's a perfectly reasonable position to say, could Drake win at Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota? I don't know that. I don't know that they can. I don't know that they can. So yeah. now you're inside the room. And in a way, you're inside my head, a lot of empty space there. <laughs> and, you know, I, I have to, and, and I mean, I fight this right up until six o'clock on Selection Sunday. Sure. Which is, man, I really think that team should. Oops. But what are they going to do? Yep. Like, I try and close my eyes. You know, I've been in the room enough for the mocks. I've talked to enough committee people over the years. I have to think, you know, if there's a short list of people on the planet outside the committee who understand this process, that I'm on it. Yeah. Like, what, like what, what is the conversation and how is it most likely to end up when they vote? And this year, it's just even extra because, like, Marlon right now has a losing record. Because n none of these teams were able to pile up six, seven, yes. eight gimmies at home. In, in the mo most were most were not. So we're going to have a team in the tournament with a losing record. I guarantee it. Wow, I guarantee it. It's interesting. And yeah. if I were, if I had a better mortgage payment today, hopefully yours, not mine. <laughs> It would I, I would pick Maryland because there's going to be no team out there with the with the combination of the wins they have and the record overall record that they have. Plus, I've seen them a few times and they're good. They are, yeah. Like you can make the argument, legitimate make the argument. I just think it would be bad for the sport if there's a team sitting out there from a league that's produced final four teams in the past that's you know 27 and one or two like like what's the point of playing games and keeping score yeah. within reason it's not like they're beating you know the division three team every night what's the point of playing games and keeping score if 27 and two gets picked ahead of 12 and 14 I'm I, with you. that's me that's just me. No, I'm with you 100, percent and and that's always been my stance: is the games have to matter, and I understand there's certain team, but you know the, the flip side is, and I've talked to, I remember about a year ago, maybe two years ago now, I had Bob Ritchie from Furman on this show, and they were mm -hmm. like 28 and five, and he's like, yeah, we don't play the level of competition, but we can't have one bad loss the entire right. year. We can't have one down night where we don't show mm -hmm. up the entire year. So, all right, real quick, I I'll let you out of here. I mean, uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to hit you with a few teams, and this is ever-evolving, and it could change by the time you listen to this. Some teams are playing tonight, but 
Real quick, I'll start with my UConn Huskies. I mean, trending in the wrong direction, three out of four. They're without their best player, but, you know, we just said it, wins matter. Where, where do you stand on them? And we're recording here about Tuesday, about noon Eastern, 11 Eastern, so it's going to change. But uh, but uh, where do you stand on UConn? I think he'll be back very soon, book night. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm not expecting – I mean, I've spoken to members of the staff, and – I think that the committee can then evaluate them with him. Yep. So they're going to get a little bit of a pass for the recent slide. And I'm betting that UConn is in at the end of the day. Like it. Um, Indiana, they just beat, swept Iowa. Um, they're, they're interesting. And I know you had your little dust up with Coach Miller last year. I actually had Coach Miller on the podcast. He he said he regretted it. But independent of that, we're not here to talk about the past. Uh, Indiana's a really fascinating team to me. They're going to make it also. Uh, the, 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 the rising tide of the Big Ten, if you will. And uh, I appreciate hearing that Archie regrets that. He hasn't said that to me. My Ooh. only regret is that he called me the wrong Sesame Street character. <laughs> he called me Oscar the Grouch, and I'm definitely a cookie monster. Very good. Uh, they're playing tonight, so it's subject to change, but we do have a lot of Arkansas fans that listen to this show. Uh, let's run, work under the assumption. Uh, let, let's say – you can do either one. I mean, I would assume losing to Kentucky, and, and I love Coach Cal. I think he's – one of the greats, but, you know, let, let's work with they win and they lose. I mean, obviously, it's – I would think a loss would be more devastating than a win would be helpful. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and that sounds completely backward when you consider yep. the two teams involved, right? Uh, but but I, I have a little method where uh, I kind of track teams' odds to make the tournament at any point, given their resume – at that moment because it just helps again inform the conversation sure and with 80 percent being the cutoff of you know well they're maybe lock is too strong a word but you know they should probably be getting you know extra gas for the bus uh and and arkansas is the first team after 80 percent at this point oh wow so they're you know 79 point whatever and I think if they win tonight, they'll they'll move into the comfort zone, um, even though they really don't have yep. a great win. They, they, they have some nice ones. They're, uh, they're going to make it. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, real quick, uh, you can take this wherever you want. I live on the West Coast. I know a lot of people involved in the Mountain West. I think they play really good mm -hmm. basketball. But again, as you said, it's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's what the committee thinks. And there's like four different teams that are currently either in your bracket, first four in, first four out, whatever. Again, you can take it wherever you want. But, um, you know, uh, it's a conference that I enjoy watching here, West Coast, late night games, things like that. Well, they're not late for you. No, uh not at all. You know, I'm the one staying up last night waiting for Colorado State, New Mexico to end so I can finish the bracket. Sure. Uh, you know, the bright side is Hawaii is not in the league anymore. <laughs> uh, sure. Nothing like an overtime game in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, it's almost like the revenge of the Mountain West this year, right? I love because it, yeah. San Diego State was so good last year and then they didn't get a chance, like a lot of great stories. Uh, to, to give us a tournament run. So so now they're doing in, in quantity a little bit what they had in quality a year ago. San Diego State is still the best team. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to have the best resume. Uh, Boise State did until they lost twice at Nevada. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, San Diego State will make it. And then from among Boise Colorado State, Utah State, at least one and maybe two will make it. They're not all going to make it. So let's set the over and under at two and a half bids for the Mountain West. And looking at the upcoming schedule and likely cannibalization, if you will, I will take the under and say two bids for them. 
Very good. Um, I can talk to you about this stuff all day. Um, you know, well, hopefully we'll do it again in the future. I'm guessing the next month or so is going to be a little too busy for you, but we'll get you on sometime in the future. But again, Joe Lenardi, not only ESPN, but the book is called Bracketology, which Bar Bracketology, March Madness, College Basketball, and the Creation of a National Obsession. It's available March uh, 2nd. If you don't, if you have a, a minute before I let you go, just tell everybody a little. I, I assume it's a lot of what we already talked about, the origins, the history, yep. but go ahead. Yeah, and it is, you, you can order it. I think the easiest thing to do is to just go to Amazon and, you know, Google Lenardi or Bracketology or both, and it comes right up. Uh, the, the last time I... I, I Googled Joe Bracketology, I think. And the my book came up and Joe Biden's book came up and mine was on top. <laughs> there you go. I'm not suggest I'm not suggesting that that's a good thing for our country. I'm just saying that it was well his stable. bracket really stinks. That's the problem. But anyway, continue. It, well, I mean, Delaware has never won a tournament game. So, you know, he's he's a little there strong. Go. There you uh, go. But yeah, the book, you know, I'd been approached. A number of times about maybe doing a book in the past and you know I always had a, a full-time job and I thought it was too much time or that I who would want to buy a book about me and etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and then with the pandemic and having time in the spring and summer uh finding a a, a co-author you know we really hit it off and it, it it it's it's a college basketball book fundamentally sure uh, and, and, and I think that's what carries it. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great history, but there's also a lot of good behind the scenes stuff for the here and now that's very transferable to any modern season and, uh, you know, kind of what, what goes on behind the curtain and, you know, what would happen to the curtain if they ever let me back there to <laughs> mess around with it. Very good. Again, the book, like you said, just Google or go to Amazon, Joe Bracketology, Joe Lenardi, but it is called Bracketology, March Madness, College Basketball, and the Creation of a National Obsession. And of course, you will see him a lot on ESPN here over the coming weeks. And like I said, it won't be this season, but I, I look forward to working with you, talking to you again in the future. I had a blast. Joe Lenardi, thank you for the time, my man. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Aaron. Stay safe out there.